Welcome to the Growler, a Who Day podcast hosted by Paul Dana and other ball friends like Mo Egger, Dave Nan Emmett, home of all your Bengals breaks, takes. Welcome to the Growler. All right, welcome into the latest edition of the Growler. It's Balls Don't Lie, Paul Dainer Jr., Dave Ninimitz here with you on a Monday. Dave, how are we doing? Doing all right. It's been a while since I've been on here. You welcome know, I gotta, back. Got to refresh myself back. with the format. Yeah. But I, yeah. the song cheered me up. I was. Yeah. Yeah. I love the song. When you go away for a little bit and you come in, you go, yeah. It kind of makes me, yeah. kind of makes me happy a little bit. <laughs> nice this could start, be the, like, this could be a good streak of three straight episodes where I do a shoulder shake in the first two minutes. I like it, like a smug like bed bug. Song. Yeah, yeah, getting excited. Well, happy like Eclipse it. Day to you, Dave. Yeah. Uh, are you going to find your way into the path of totality? Or the trail no, of I'm totality? Gonna put the, but I'm putting the glasses on right now. <laughs> you know who is? It's going right over Hamilton, Ohio. And I have zero doubt a certain fellow we know is going to be out there scarfing down Arby's curly fries and just staring <laughs> at the sun, burning out his co- rods and cones. And you'll see him on the next show with some sort of bandages over his eyes because it's how they roll in Hamilton. Yep. Snuck down into the front row. <laughs> you get the best view of the sun. Yeah. There, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. No, no point. Jay and I hope we'll have to discuss his, uh, his lunar eclipse philosophy. Uh, will this in, will this yield any? You think any alien activity will come out of this? You can carry on to Mo as well. I mean, the eclipse could be very fertile for material for this show. Mo will be on in a little bit. We'll ask him his thoughts on the potential for alien activity <laughs> uh, with with this incident. Yeah, I mean, it's always possible. Uh, I, I'm I'm over the eclipse. I'm going to actually talk to Mo about like what is the the eclipse topic in the Bengals world. Like that's just, Mm. I can't believe it's been talked about this long (laughs) for what amounts to four minutes. If Mm. you're lucky, it's just, it's just so much. It's just, just, it's just a lot, but we got a lot of other stuff to get to Dave, a lot to get to today. I mentioned Mo's going to come on. I have my uh, big board 1.0, which is totally different than a mock draft. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so it's like a totally different way to say names and discuss them uh, that is going to be out tomorrow morning. But I I do think that there are some interesting things when you really start the process of trying. And I know everybody's always constantly doing that. But like to really say this guy versus that guy crossing positions, getting into that actual world of of what does that look like? And I think. There were some parts of it that are particularly hard, I think, for this year's team. And I so we can talk about that uh, a little bit before we get in uh, with to it with Mo. And we'll talk about some other bits of news that are popping off. Tavondre Sweat from Texas, the big run stopping defensive tackle, caught a, uh, a DWI this weekend. Obviously, the Bengals had him in. Obviously, they have him interest. He's kind of a very, a very much second round mocked player to the Bengals. I want to talk a little bit about him and character and these types of things through the Bengals lens anymore, because that's changed a little bit. And I feel like that's an interesting combo that we can have as we get into stuff. But let's um, let's start taking through a bit of news. Wednesday, everybody, big day Wednesday, not just me and Jay back for our latest episode. And we're going to find out about you know, his bandages on his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the Beast is out Wednesday, which is, I mean, the mile post as far as I'm concerned in draft coverage. It's when the conversation goes from being, I think, to, no, this is like we have, we yeah. can really tangibly look at this now and, and be very s- serious because nobody goes deeper than Dane. If You probably know if you're listening to this podcast by now. We'll have him on uh, between now and the draft and talk a little bit more about it. But that comes out Wednesday. A lot of good stuff that we can do off that. Everybody's looking forward to that. I mean, the amount of people that we have now at The Athletic working behind the scenes to to get that thing to the finish line beyond what Dane does as a one-man just animal – uh, yeah. is, is it's like an up. encyclopedia. It's crazy yeah. how much he gets in there. And I, I think what's always cool about it, and I think one thing we'll, you know, all the writers will delve into, 
is you can kind of start getting a better idea of those later round guys too. You, you start looking at interesting names and how they fit and you find out some information about guys that we've just seen their names bounced around. But Dane gets so into it, you start finding out everything about these dudes. So I think we'll have some pretty cool content coming up, um, just kind of digging into to guys that could fall into where the Bengals pick even later than the first few picks. There is no question. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, so all that coming your way here for too long. Um, let's on Wednesday. I'm also we're going to dive into the wide receivers with Jay. So keep an eye out for that. Point out a little bit more that Hayden Winks from uh, Underdog Fantasy. They have done incredible work uh, putting together videos of each receiver prospect. It's great stuff. Talk to him a little bit. You'll hear from him on Wednesday as well as, as we dive into the receivers and how big that's going to be coming up here soon. Let's um, We've got Joe Burrow making an appearance this week. Yeah. He's ready. He's going to be at the uh, live New Heights podcast at Nippert at Night. It's the whole thing. Burrow in the building. We've got Kelsey's who knows who else will show up over there quite a deal man you could what a what a what a great thing for the podcast world you know like <laughs> it's, it's just really incredible but burrow signing up to to be there uh that's quite a get it's a huge get uh it's just crazy to me how far those just their status in pop culture right now, the Kelsey brothers. Mm-hmm. I think I think Jason was in WrestleMania the other night. Yeah. Like the first yeah. night of it. Mm-hmm. Um and then when you see him get a guy like Burrow, it's like they're just they're kind of doing whatever they want right now. So that'd be that'd be interesting to see what Burrow has to say. Those seem to be the places where we get tidbits about like his his comeback from injury and like he'll he'll kind of give some some clues of where he's at hopefully yeah you never you never quite i think the fact that he is he's agreed to do it is a great sign i mean i think yeah, you know no th- it shows and kind of what you've seen he's been out and about more the offseason program's coming up soon it just seems to be all of this has continued to be as we've said good signs of pro- progress if he if he was like having concerns and not super he's not going to want to go into a high profile event like that everybody knows that's what's going to be something's going to be talked about seems like a lot of happiness and confidence happening over in that realm if you judge by hey he's agreeing to do that and that's been the case that's everything that we've heard this entire time in the background it's just a matter of going through the process here i go again taking your steps let's wait and see it see what it looks like as you get closer to the season and the strength builds all the way up that's all i'm saying but more and more good signs is, is all that that is. Um, we'll be in the building next week. Offseason program begins soon. Players be back. You'll you'll have that kind of part of everything kicking back up, which is good, which is good. We'll start. We'll hear from Zach Taylor. We'll hear from, of course, Duke Tobin for the draft. We'll have some open locker rooms where we can kind of get more on where a, a lot of players and people are at. And some of them might not be at Paycor Stadium, which could be news as well. Yeah, no doubt. I think we know who they are. <laughs> yeah, I do. I would not expect to to walk up and be able to talk to T Higgins on uh, on that first practice day. Yeah, that would not would not anticipate that. Um, let's talk about the big board. Right. Um, so I think when you when I kind of went through this exercise and and we we've all kind of done versions of this, obviously, but there's just a couple things that I just pinning this down how fascinating this is for the Bengals is that I think we can circle these group of offensive linemen pretty clearly that's not a secret we've been talking about that for months yeah the question is who infiltrates that group and Mm. and where so you're one yet ranking the offensive linemen is its own thing and they're going through that process right now of you know Kelly's Fuaga, Troy Fotanyu, Marius Mims, Olufashanu, J.C. Latham. I mean, you, Joe Alt, I guess. You know, throw. You've got all of these names there that are in the mix. Well, where does Byron Murphy fit in there? Where does Brock yeah. Bowers 
fit in there? Where do the corners fit in there? Where does Johnny Newton, the other yeah. defensive tackle from Illinois, where does he fit in there? I think figuring out where to put those in is inevitably going to be in, insanely important because that's very easily the decision that decides what direction you end up going with all these paths that we've talked about. Um, yeah. And I find I found that really hard. The Murphy, the Murphy one, I I sort of flip back and forth with because it's tough. You see a, an interesting range with Murphy. I, 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 yeah. Some experts and analysts see him going way up, and then others see him dropping further than I would think he'd go. But it, doesn't it kind of hinge on whether there's a run on these offensive tackles? If you get teams trading up and you get a few teams that want them. I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility that you see a Bowers drop. I, maybe I'm crazy because I, you know, he's he's rated so high and everybody has so much buzz about him. But I think that that's where the Bengals are in kind of an interesting spot because I think we just assume they can have their pick of these offensive linemen. But what if there's a run on them? Do you suddenly, if you've rated a guy kind of on the bottom end of that group you mentioned, but one of these other studs drops down there, then it gets back to the old best available. And I, you've talked about it, that 18 is just kind of a good spot, but it's also such a variable, you know, like you're going to yeah. get a good player there, but it's just, are you going to meet a need at that point? And I think you're right. It's it's sorting out those offensive linemen to figure out who's going where. You, know, you, you even mentioned Joe Alt on the big board and I don't think anyone sees Joe Alt dropping, but who knows? Like we still have a right. couple of weeks to go, and who knows how people fall in love with other guys? So it's just it's hard to pinpoint. We see this in this time of year a lot. Is that the the consensus? And you know, we can look up the the consensus big board here, and you can see where the general draft industry complex has decided to say about people and those are narratives right and and it's where the the what ends up coming out a lot in the week before the draft is a much more accurate view than now because there's a lot of well the media is here but teams are here okay mm -hmm. these are teams don't see and because these narratives have been spinning for so long and they get out of control and gain steam it's well it's not really the way it is and you see that a lot, specifically when you get into this middle portion of round one, where anybody with eyes can tell you, well, you know, Malik Neighbors, I think yeah. is pretty good and uh, probably will go early in this draft. But once you get into that middle, more into that middle ground, you see narratives that have taken over and and players that teams really like that that uh, ascend. And so you you do you end up all over the place. But for me, you know, I think the guys that we have seen come in to town on these visits, Tylee Fuaga, mm -hmm. Troy Fotanyu, Amarius Mims, I think they're in for a reason. And yeah. because I think that's where they see the the top fit group for them. Now I would throw JC Latham in there, but we you don't know specifically, you know, if there if there's still more visits to, to happen or whatever. It's not this isn't about visits, but like, you know, that's an open. Let, let, let me remind you last year, okay? Emmanuel Forbes, who we know they really liked, came in. Miles Murphy came in. Nolan Smith came in. Nolan Smith went one pick after Miles Murphy. You know, they yeah. the previous year, Cam Taylor Britt came in for a late visit. They were they were eyeing him in round two. Like there is, we know this is part of it and I, and I think the the early indication with, with that shows you what we already knew which is boy that feels like the core group the, and and I, I think I just I have Fuwaga, Fatanyu, Mims in that order um, mm -hmm. but again that's I think these are things that, the, these are things that they have not hashed out yet okay like they have a general idea but they have to sit down and officially put that order in, and that is not complete so we can all sit here and say i got this i got that they're gonna do this they don't know exactly what they're gonna do yet but i think we know the general grouping yeah you know of of who of who it's gonna be who they're looking at but is there i mean i guess there's always the chance too that someone shows up at their pick that they had 
never dreamed would still be there. I mean, I think we look at so many mocks, we don't think that one of those top receivers could ever drop down, but they could. I mean, mm -hmm. do you feel like do you feel like the Bengals are the kind of team that are going to stick to what you're talking about? You know, the the core that they've brought in and who they sort out as their guys. Or do you think they're the, the type of team that will swerve off the plan if they're surprised by somebody that's too good to pass up on? I think I think they're I, I don't see a major I mean I'd be I don't think you'd see a major swerve. Yeah. Um you you never know because of the, what we've mentioned with the variables of that area. But I just think you know the one thing about the all these tackles being is it's just you you got to take advantage of it, okay? The draft mm -hmm. hands you things certain years, okay? And this year, the draft is handing a bunch of teams that want offensive line help, tons of it, in round one. And, and and so to not take advantage of what is going to be there for them, to me, would be a misstep and I think is part of their plan and makes the most sense. And so I, I just – feel like they're leaning into that. I, I don't see them like they went they went two decades without taking a defensive lineman in the first round and they took Miles yeah. Murphy last year. I, I don't see them piling another guy on there where they're already trying to figure out where to find snaps for Miles Murphy. I know it's best player available and they did that last year, but it, you know, I, I think at a certain point you, you have to think about the full totality of the team. Totality. Yeah. There I am. Snuck it in there. <laughs> well uh, done. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but it's and I and that's why I don't you know see a major swerve. But I, I think you talk about Murphy, and I think he's the he's the one wild card for me that you swerve for. I, now I you know I have him up in the top, and I I put him in there in the middle of those guys, but picking between those. You know, you're you're splitting hairs. You know, you yeah. everybody has their pluses and minuses. Mims doesn't have a ton of experience, right? But he looks exactly like the other guys that they've signed. Okay, like this freakish right. six eight three forty fifty six, like Trent Brown, Orlando Brown, and Marius Mims are in the same body. Okay, and and yeah. they're the ones doing this and valuing those types of fits more than anything else. So yeah, that that makes sense. But what are you getting? Fuaga has all these uh, the intensity that you love, like you love the way he plays. You, you, he, you've got the pass protecting element where he's been a specialist there, and that's what you want. Fatan, you the same way, and they both bring you some position flex where they could move around if you needed them to, mm -hmm. and you love that. You know, as a chance yeah. to to put somebody somewhere else if that fits you at a time and that can cover you in multiple spots and but you have all the talent you would ever want latham is a essentially and mims are in that same conversation where there's pros and cons to them but big powerful anchored pass pro like we hear these terms from them over and over again so that group um you know, all just seem to fit snug. And so where Bowers to me goes behind them all because I just, because yeah. that's the plan. Cause that fits so much of everything they want to do and have done that. I don't see them saying, you know what? We're going to go above these tackles that all fit us so well. If, if that were to happen, but I think that's a tough conversation that they're having to have is those two guys in particular is, is Murphy and Bowers and where do they fit amongst this plan a positional fit yeah i mean I, I would say with bowers history just tells us after last year and what they've done the last few years that they're just not going to put that value on a tight end i i think as fans and observers we drool at the idea of that being a weapon for joe burrow and being a way to offset if and when t higgins is gone another pass catcher but like I said, it, it, what they've shown would indicate if, if you weren't going to take a tight end last year, I don't think you're taking a, a tight end in the first round this year. Um, yep. He may be a little bit different than the rest, but I just don't see that. I've thought from the beginning, Murphy is just, I've said, I, I think he's another Christian Wilkins. He's another Quinnen Williams. He's one of these guys that has the potential to come in and 
just dominate. And those are the guys getting the big bucks right now because everybody wants them. So I, I would swerve for him personally, but I get what you're saying too, that you get this big crop of great offensive linemen or potentially great offensive linemen. And it's hard to ignore that, especially since you've done some patchwork over the years to keep the offensive line together. Yeah, I mean, there are positions that they've done just fine at. Tight end, right tackle, they've just done just fine at finding value in free agency and putting guys that come in there uh, and have been solid starters. The pro- and They haven't been able to keep them healthy, but, I mean, they haven't been terrible yeah. pieces over there, whereas you just cannot find game-wrecking defensive tackles anywhere other than the first round of the draft. Like, it's almost impossible, okay? And so... And Byron Murphy, like I'll, I'll get more into this when we talk specifically right. about the defensive tackles. But you know, I, I you go back and you look at win rate and true pass set win rate in in PFF stuff over the last ten years, and he is up at the top of the list in the last ten years. And that and those that have led Power Five in that category, I bet you can know some of the names on the list. They're very rich these days. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's names like Christian Barmore and Quinnen Williams and Jeffrey Simmons and Jonathan Allen and Chris Jones, DeForest Buckner, Grady Jarrett. Those are the names on the list. OK, and Byron Murphy's numbers are actually better than all of them. Almost. There are a couple of busts mm-hmm. in that group, but that's it. Like, that's where these guys are coming from. That's where they get picked in the first round. And so that's why. Is he a real dude? You know, that's a question for them to figure out. But numbers suggest yeah. he will be. And look at these contracts. Like, this mm-hmm. is the defensive defensive tackle has follow the money, man. This league is follow mm-hmm. the money league. Teams know what, you know, that's when you have all this quick game, all this two shell. Everything is there. It's you got to be able to get in the quarterback's face and make them comfortable right in front of them. Their quarterbacks are so much better at dealing with these edge rushers. That's why so much money is going to the defensive tackles, and they're so hard to find. There's so much fewer of them. And so yeah. when you could have a guy, man, that's insanely valuable. And I just think there's a lot of tough conversations to be had about where that fits inside of that plan a offensive tackle group and that's and and i think that's the question of round one for me uh at this point from a Bengals perspective and you know we'll detail it more as i get into the defensive tackles and and talk more with some of the coaches and duke and zach as we get back in the building to, to even hone down even more and but it's 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 a tough one for them to figure out and i think the whole league is trying to figure figure that out too because not everybody's sold on byron murphy I mean, that's not a slam dunk, Uh, but everybody is sold on the concept of having someone who does things that Byron Murphy did at Texas last year. (laughs) And if right, exactly, that's, that's where you, that's where you end up in that conversation. All right, let's shift. Go ahead. No, go ahead. It's also nice to have that guy on his rookie contract. If he truly is a stud. I mean, when you look at the, at the paydays on these guys to have this guy for a few years, that you're paying a rookie salary that is massive so i think that should but offensive tackle too gets paid a lot so you know you get a young guy in there the only thing is they've they've got veteran tackle set right now so i don't know i don't think you can go wrong these guys are all gonna be good they're all good they're all good players you can <laughs> go wrong dave that's why we talk about it that's as true. much as we do and do not forget it uh, all right <laughs> it's true uh, <laughs> uh welcome in good to have you here Hi! Happy Happy Eclipse Day to you. Um, I'm ex- are, are you and your family prepared? I got the. Glasses. Oh, okay, very good. I was driving up 71 the other day, and one of those signs, solar eclipse, April 8th. Plan ahead. Have you and your family planned ahead? Yeah, because we okay. had to because school is out. Oh yeah, we so. had that. We had that too. Fortunately, my wife is off today, so we did have mm. to plan ahead in that regard. We got the half day. A half day at daycare is what we got out of it, so mm. we're we're utilizing that right now. But then then we're just back in the driver's seat again. So school's okay. like, yeah, we'll let y'all handle this. Yeah, so fine. that's fine. Okay. Uh, I have I have one question for you that I feel like is a good way to start on a Monday morning. Let's mm-hmm. 
it's been kind of a weird weekend, right? We had a lot of weird stuff happening on. And I'll, I'll get to some of the weird stuff. Okay. Uh, in a second. Yeah. But so let's start with some kind of, let's just start with some, some pessimism. Right. Oh, okay. I think that's a great place to start your week off. Oh at, boy. Okay? Yeah. Here we go. What's, what's your biggest fear about the Bengals draft? I think everybody kind of has something where it's like, oh, I hope they don't try to do this again. Or I, I hope this doesn't turn into a, oh, we decided to do that. Is there something in the back of your head with this draft, whether it's from a first round or a overall uh, perspective that you're like, I have a, I have nervousness or apprehension about about this happening? that maybe they overthink it, right? Mm -hmm. That maybe they try to get a little bit too cute. You know, we, we talked about this on this podcast and we talked about this on my show. I think the possibility of them trading the 18th pick is really interesting. Um, and and I, I could understand why they would do that. At the same time, sometimes it's like, look, there's a player here who's really good, who fits what you want. Just take them, right? Yeah. And, and so... Not that I feel like that's going to be my takeaway in the immediate aftermath of the draft, but you could certainly see a point where, you know, down the road, hey, they could have taken this guy at 18. Instead, they got cute and they got crazy and they added extra picks. And boy, this player they could have taken ended up being <clears throat> exactly what they wanted and they should have just taken him. Like for, for as interesting and for as much merit as there is to the idea that you could flip the 18th pick for more draft capital so you could address all these different positions. You know, if we're talking about, as you guys just were, a defensive tackle, or we're talking about uh, an offensive lineman, particularly a right tackle, and a player that you have graded high on your board is there, there is a part of me that just says, just don't overthink this, just take them. And so I don't know that that's fear. I don't know that that's apprehension. That's kind of the fun part of the draft, right? Yeah. Is is to look three, four years down the road and see how the decision making, you know, uh, if it worked. Um, and, and that's not to say that I'm, I'm opposed to making a trade. In fact, I'm more in favor of making one than not at the same time. You know, sometimes the obvious is a little bit too obvious, right? And so if the obvious is here's a guy they need who plays the position that they need to address. There is a part of me that says, look, just take the player and move on. And and how that plays out, I'm not fearful, but I I think is is interesting. This is kind of this is piggybacking off of something that I just talked with Dave about in, in regards to, you know, setting up my big board, which is much yeah. different than a mock draft. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but you know, what does the Bengals board look like, obviously? And to me, it's take what the draft gives you. Yeah. You know. Some sometimes just take everyone is acknowledging and because I think it is obvious this draft is giving you tackles in round one and receivers in round two. You need both of those things, right? Yeah, yeah. they're both great. Your offense succeeding with Joe Burrow at the helm is the key to your success. And I'm not here to kick. And again, we just talked about Byron Murphy and defense tackles. It's all fine. But what is the draft giving you? The draft is giving you this gift of protection <laughs> for Joe Burrow in round one at 18. You're not yeah. supposed to get, you know, certifiable, perfect, I really strong fits at this mm -hmm. point in the first round. It's giving you that gift. Take it. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. giving you this gift of receivers that can be an ideal fit for what you have in your system to play in between two great outside guys or one that has versatility to move everywhere you can even get inside outside versatility dudes that can give you explosiveness all this other stuff in the middle of the round too take what the draft is giving you mm -hmm. i worry about them going too far out like you know we're best player available yeah best player available is part of what fits your team where it's at right now and not getting too involved like i don't want to see a Darquez, Denard, Drake, Kirkpatrick. <laughs> we fifth corner who's going to play special teams, but he's going to be there in the future. Right. Think what the draft is getting you, the guys that can help you this year, next year, that you see in your very near future plans that fit where your roster is currently constructed and not, not get too cute. Yeah, so, you know, let's just say there's uh, a right tackle who you feel like and who the consensus says could play week one. 
and be comparable, if not even better, in the short term than the guy you had playing the position last year. That's a lot to ask. But that player is there, and you say no, and you trade down, and you add a Friday pick or a Friday pick and a Saturday pick, whatever, and you take a player who's maybe not quite as good. It may work. It, it may work. And there's, again, there's a lot of validity to the suggestion that they're better off addressing every position of need that they can by accumulating picks. But you're right, man. I mean, if if priority number one for the Cincinnati Bengals is to ensure that Joe Burrow is healthy, what's wrong with taking the guy who best ensures his health? And if that player is there at 18 and there's a guy that you could maybe take at, I don't know, 24, 25, 26, who's maybe not quite as good, is that really a gamble worth taking? I, I think it's a fair question. So you're right. I mean, it's it's pretty obvious what they need and what they need meshes with where the, the the depth is and where the quality is in rounds one and two. So do you have to overthink it? You know, do we have to to twist ourselves in knots trying to come up with ways where they could add draft capital? Not necessarily. And so I'm really interested. You know, the draft is always interesting, but where they are right now because of the possibilities is, is fascinating. And again, I don't, I'm not going to say on draft night that there is a wrong answer but it will be really fascinating to see how things play out in regards to what they do and in regards to maybe some of the things they could have done, including just take the best tackle available with the 18th overall pick. Yeah. Or, you know, see which tackle is going to turn into a future bust that fans hate forever. In round two or three. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. That's like, that's what ends up happening, you know, because you just, you, you just certain things that you got to try to solidify. And because that guy's going to have to play, you just mm-hmm. don't, there's just the success stories are non-existent. You know, right. we, I know we, we, we did that whole thing. I don't want to, sure. re- you know, go down that road again. Cause we, we already did that topic, but like it's part of taking what the draft gives you, you know? And so I, I, I think, you know, outside of them giving you the next Geno Atkins potentially for your team and your mm-hmm. franchise, um, you know, it feels like that's there's there's few other things that should take you into that place. Like you start taking the, looking at the corners, or you know, but the uh, edge rusher just had the talent. He right. was one notch above. Right, and it's like, oh, but now you're that's a guy. He's not. He's going to be what? He's going battling Joseph Osai for for edge four. Like I get that. Like you, you're oh, but but he is the player who he is, and you're going to say maybe you need him. Yeah, but it doesn't really fit what you really need right now, and I. Yeah, those are that's the those are the get cute moves that then put you in weird places in round two, three, and four. I want to know on on Thursday and Friday which players that they could draft put this team in a better position to win the title this year. Mm-hmm. I have never been less interested in the future. <laughs> I mean, I, I you know I'm I'm serious. Yeah. Like I've I've never been. I, I get it. You know I've I've said often Duke Tobin's not a fan. Duke Tobin's got a an interesting job uh, like everybody else in his capacity that actually has the title of GM where you have to balance short-term concerns with long-term considerations. So his job is to fortify the fu- fortify the short term and, and, and ensure that the future is going to be bright. I'm putting that clumsily, but I get, I, I don't care. I want to win the title this year. I mean, the whole thing for me behind not wanting to trade T Higgins is I want to take a go at it with this core group of guys. And I think they can. Um, and so I'm I'm less interested in hey here's here's a project that uh, you know we're not going to ask much of them this year but wait a year I, I'm I'm not interested I, I want to know who are the players that can best help them win in 2024 and chances are those guys could also help you win in 2025 and beyond I for the first time maybe ever I'm looking at the draft through a very 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 narrow lens and so if a player is added on Thursday and Friday. And the narrative surrounding him is, well, he's the kind of guy, you know, you're not you're not going to get much of from him this year because they have players at his position or he's a bit of a project, eh, not interested. I want guys on Thursday and Friday that you could plug into certain roles that make this team better equipped to win a title this year. That is not the lens through which I usually look at a draft, and I know it's not the lens through which a guy like Duke Tobin looks at the draft, but me as a fan, I think they can win the whole thing this year. And again, keeping T Higgins being adamant about keeping T T Higgins for me is I want to win it this year. They're best equipped to win it with T Higgins this year. So I want everything subsequent to the decision to keep T Higgins to fall in line with that 
what is what is what is better off for winning the title this year? And I think you can make a clear uh, case for look the the player at eighteen who's just better than the guy you're going to take at twenty six aligns with that. Yeah, I I you know I view the outside X receiver future T Higgins in the get cute mold as well. Like when the receiver comes, he better be able to play inside or yeah. have inside outside versatility because I don't want to see the net. Cause if you're going for it, right. By mm-hmm. keeping T then not using your other prime assets to complement that decision as well. Yeah. I, I, you of course want the next T, but I, you, I just, don't like the idea of looking at the receiver group and we'll talk more about this with Jay on Wednesday as we do the full receiver dive but like of of going there because I feel like that is the antithesis of the decision you're making with T here unless you're trading him and really going for the full craziness (laughs) yeah I mean the decision that you're making here I think what you do with drafting the receiver needs to complement that not back up 20 25 26 27 in the in that regard i just you go down that road when you more need to go down that road specifically with the way receivers can can so quickly be implemented here i don't think you need to go a year early on that you know you you need somebody that can be a menace inside and also work outside to give you the ability to move jamar chase around and keep defenses guessing as much as possible not feel stationary in there the guy that just plays outside or the guy that only can play inside on the slot right. are problematic in that, in that regard. Uh, and, and so that's, that's kind of the other get cute move that I, I have some, some fear, some apprehension about if they were to go that way. Yeah. I, I, I could not agree more. I I'm, I'm for anybody that that allows them to, to use T in a variety of ways, which is something we've seen them try to do and something we've heard a lot yeah. about how they want to do, but they I'm sure want to do it even more. So give me somebody who makes, Jamar Chase more uh flexible or, or or more versatile. And then in in the short term, yeah, I'm not interested in that. Well, he's an outside guy. Okay. Or he's an inside guy. Like g- give me, give me a guy who could be used as a chess piece in 2024. And and again, yeah. like that's my question on not, not so much after the draft, but just after the first two rounds is can these players help them win this year? Because I think they can. And, mm-hmm. and, and if the answer to that is yes, then well, chances are they're going to fit somehow in the future too. But I'm, I'm uh, for the first time ever, I'm looking at this really through a very simple, you know, prism. I, I want to win the title this year because I think they can and everything they've done this off season so far, I think should align with what the draft strategy is. So I, I, I'm going to ask that on Saturday morning, even before we get started with round four. Are they better equipped to win the title this year based on who they've drafted? Not that you draft somebody and that takes you from pretender to contender or from fringe contender to contender. I think they're contenders no matter what. But does the the guy they take at 18 and the players they take on Friday, do those players, do they do they make them a little bit stronger in the effort to win the title this year? And that's that, that to me is, for me, that is the draft storyline. Yes. All right. But no, it's not the draft storyline, what I'm about to talk about. <laughs> okay. Well, one, it was brought up earlier that we should – I don't know if you have any opinion on if there's concerns about uh-huh. this eclipse causing alien activity. Oh. Maybe I should broach that to you. Are you okay. Do you have any concerns? Should, should is that something maybe we should revisit next week is, is if the eclipse brought on any alien activity and if that's an issue? Or you, is that something that you're looking for? N- no. <laughs> exactly <laughs> that was kind of my lean there i wasn't gonna go there but I, just wanted, I wanted to make sure we're, we're uh we're together on that okay yeah here's the thing though between the eclipse and the fact that like we're now debating the validity of goat as a topic is like oh. a thing now i'm so sick of it yeah what is the most beaten into the ground topic in the bengal's stratosphere that you can think of, let's say over the past, just really Burrow era, fine. Uh, what is the most beaten into the ground topic that you just don't have the stomach for? I feel the eclipse has done that to me. Anytime I see the word goat used and people talking mm-hmm. about its usage, it sends me to the dark place. Like, and I know those exist in the Bengals world. Sure. Yeah. What? What is it for you? So really quickly on the the goat thing, because 
everybody's doing this in the aftermath of the uh, the women's national championship game. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not equipped to tell you who the goat of women's college basketball is. I'm willing to admit that. What's funny is, so Iowa loses, and then I hear folks that go, well, she can't be the goat. And then my response is, cool, who is? And they don't know. Yes. So if you're going to tell me someone's not the goat, then you have to tell me who is. I hate goat talk. Oh, my, my take is uh, on really quick on the, the Caitlin Clark thing is this. Um, Magic Johnson is probably not the greatest basketball player of all time. And Larry Bird is probably not the greatest basketball player of all time. But they were really, really good and extraordinarily instrumental in the growth of that league. Right. That's undeniable. Isn't uh-huh. that good enough? Isn't that good enough? So yeah. 20 years from now, if somebody says the name Caitlin Clark, I'm going to say, you know what? On a Friday evening, I was at an establishment in Northern Kentucky where there were 40 people transfixed on a women's college basketball game, primarily, not only, but primarily because of Caitlin Clark. That's a really damn good legacy. Yep. So I, I now in terms of Bengals, topics that have just been beaten into the ground. All yes. right. Burrow yes. era. Burrow era. Well, let's go Burrow era. Although, if you want to bring out some gems from the past, I'm I'm here. I I mean, I would say go ahead. I, I have oh, I have a gem ahead. from the past. Go ahead. Go, go, go ahead. What about gem from the past of the Bengals don't draft players with character problems anymore. That's a thing of the past. This is the early in my time covering the team from ten to like fifteen. People were just crushing the Bengals every year. Well, any guy with character problems in round one or two, they were always like, well, you know, the Bengals will take them. And then Bengals fans would get all bent out of shape. Like, no, we don't do that anymore. Like, well, they really don't do that anymore. They have kind of moved on from that. But you had to keep rehashing it over and over again every year at the same time of year. Just kept showing back up. That one was uh, that one's up there uh, for just I just didn't have the stomach for it after a while. And it would, and it would just be it would always be some random national person that would just set Bengals fans off with mm-hmm. one comment or one thing said on a show. And off we go into that stupid conversation again. Yes. So here's my blast from the past. Okay. And, and you and I used to have some fun with this back in the day. Is the blackout going to be lifted? Oh, my God. Oh, wait a minute. They've applied for, and they've gotten the 24 hour extension. Mm. And then, I mean, and, and sometimes this would happen during good seasons, right? 09, uh, 2012. I think 2012 was the last year of the blackout. Yeah, the year that there was the BOGO at the uh, in the yes. last game to get, yes. try to fill the stadium. Yeah. So every, you know, you would, you would do the, the same routine. Like, you know, you guys would report like, well, on Monday, like, well, as of as of uh, noon today, the Bengals said they have uh, 8,000 tickets remaining. They've got to sell them out by 1 o'clock on Thursday. And then, you know, invariably I'd get phone calls from people upset that the game wasn't going to be on television, mad at the people who weren't buying tickets so they could watch the game on television. Yes. And then the the whole, well, they've, they've gotten the 24-hour extension. Who's going to buy the tickets? Why is nobody buying the tickets? Is Mike Brown going to buy the tickets and give them to somebody? And so... We would do this on on almost a weekly basis for years, wondering about the blackout, finger pointing about the blackout, having to talk about the blackout, and then uh, it, it that got to be completely and totally miserable. So, the, thankfully, the, the NFL got rid of that antiquated rule. We no longer have to do blackout talk in the Burrow era. I'll be very simple about this: the Joe Mixon conversation. Yeah, yeah. Which, which you know, t- to be, to be fair, got really interesting once he left because now he's in Houston, the Texans are going for it. They've paid him money. Like suddenly Joe Mixon's a very fascinating character, but I, I we, we had the conversation for, for so long that we, at the end, there was nothing new to say. And it felt like you were either pro Joe or anti Joe. And, and I'm was neither. I was pro Bengals. Like I, I want the Bengals to do what's best for the Bengals. But it just felt like this was an, a divisive issue where people on both sides planted their flag. And, and I was in favor of moving on a year ago. I was in favor of moving on here. And, you know, you, you could do the thing where you talk about 
what he's meant to the franchise and what type of player he was and how he bridged the gap from what the Bengals used to be to what they turned into and his role in, in that happening. Um, I, but it felt like a lot of folks didn't want to do that. And so I, I remember just, you know, a month and a half ago going, God, if, if they keep Joe Mixon, I, I, I guess we don't really have to talk about him anymore. And if they move on from him, I I guess we really don't have to talk about him anymore. That one to me uh, was the one that I, I just, I had nothing else to say. And it felt like there was nothing else really out there that was original when the conversation came up until the Houston Texans decided to give him a bunch of money. Yes. Uh, That is, I think that's a clear number one. T. Higgins chasing him down, though. Uh, oh, yeah. In, in, you know, and and it was part of the reason why I wanted to do the one time I'm taking the big, this is it mm-hmm. on this thing with the four part series because I didn't want to have to keep coming back and doing it over and over and over and over again. And we're going on multiple years now with this. That's what happens when it starts stretching. Bates was like that, but Bates was interesting because he was kind of the first time through. Yeah. And, and, it, and the conversation changed at a couple of different spots. You you just, you know, I just feel like we kind of keep going down this conversation. And it's important. It's not that these aren't important. They just wear on you. And it's yeah. like we just talk about it. it ha- and it's something that always gets brought up. Anytime I ask for questions, it's like you would always get a mixing question. And now you're always getting a Higgins question. And, you know, is I bet you Joe Burrow being injury prone is going to be the one of the next five years. Is he? Mm-hmm. Isn't he? Like, what does that mean? And it's not that they're not important. They just, how many times can you talk about if a guy's injury prone or if what they should do with somebody over the course of, you know, almost a thousand days, right? Yeah. Like we're talking multiple years. It's just, it's just where it just wears on you a little bit. And I think that's, that's where, that's where I'm at where every time I, it kind of happens now, I'm like, Oh, are we going to have to do this again? Yeah. But, I, I think for, for, for us, and and I think you would say the same, like our, our challenge is always try to take the same topic and make it fresh. Right. And, and, you know, I used to have a boss who would say, right. When you're tired of talking about something is when the audience is just getting into it. And so I'm tired of talking about T Higgins, but, but I also know you're right. Like when you throw it out there for questions, I'm sure that's what everybody wants to talk about. Right. And, And so, that topic moves the meter, but I'm now out of things to say. And yeah. so it's, it's, do I regurgitate just the same old takes? You know, I, I, I struggle with that. I, I struggle with that and have on, on a, a, a number of different uh, uh, topics that have arisen throughout the years. I mean, I could do like a greatest hits. Yeah. That, like that, maybe, I mean, I mean, because there's plenty, I mean, sure. you could just go by era. You could go by era, the greatest hits of each decade, the all decade, well, and then team. you could also do like the, so when the Bengals had the ring of honor, we, we kind of did a, oh. a, we did a funeral for that topic because on a, like a, a lazy, like June day, you could always pull that off the shelf. Should the Bengals mm-hmm. have a ring of honor? Why don't they have one? Who would be, in, be it? in it? Right. <laughs> what, what, I mean, I, you did a, an imaginary one, right. Yep. And, and had me up in studio to talk about who I would, I would. So when, when they put one in, I'm like, okay, I guess we're, we have to get rid of that one. And then when they got new uniforms, because I was always like, hey, let's freshen up the look. But well, then they got new uniforms. Well, we had to bury that topic because, you know, that was always one that you could you could pull off the shelf. Uh, you know, like there was this thing on an annual basis for years when Andy was the quarterback where it was like, well, does, is this the year he takes a leap forward? And then I was always the bad guy, like, eh, probably not. But, you know, OK, I might still win some games with him. Uh, that was always one that uh, got. Uh, frustrating and and trite for for me, but yeah. The short term run Hall of Fame, by the way, Andy Dalton's yeah. hair. Oh, I love and that I mean, one. It, it, I know it's just I'm just trying to set you up for your greatest had, interview that you've done. The hairdresser, you had, had his hair. hairdresser on. We had the hairdresser it's, on the show. Yeah, I mean, it, but that is the type of journalism that we want, right? And that we yeah. desire, which is why I look forward to being on your show from three to four. It's the sort of tomorrow. stuff we do. It's a sort and, of and we'll talk about T. Higgins, maybe. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> it's very possible. Well, and the thing would... is, that t- unless he, like, because it's, you know, you got to follow all the cryptic tweets. So is there going to be a cryptic tweet? Mm. Like, now you're on cr- cryptic tweet watch with T. Higgins. So maybe he'll send something cryptic, and then we have to 
to uh, address. Oh, I hate vague tweet. Vague tweet reaction is just it's 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 the lowest level. It's it's when you've reached the point where it's over like that's to me that's the end of the conversation when we're in deep breakdowns over over vague tweets that's when i've had that's when i've absolutely had enough uh all right mo appreciate your time tuesday three to four espn fifteen thirty. myself and mo but you can always get your full serving of mo every day from three to six on espn 15 i can't believe i didn't mention practice bubble because we can't talk about that anymore either the bubble i know so many this is the problem with new bangles right they've gotten <laughs> rid of all the old topics that were just hammered <laughs> into the ground for decades wow. they're killing you they're forcing you to be better too <laughs> good luck with that <laughs> thanks mo see ya all right great having mo with us dave your your thoughts mo is the goat and I oh, will have you say guy. otherwise. Yeah. 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 I'll give Unless you, you want to debate it. Do you, you want to debate it? Maybe we maybe we do maybe we do a Mount Rushmore. <laughs> uh, a Mount, Mount Rushmore, Rushmore of goats. Can you do a goat rushmore? Isn't it funny that like goat, like if you're the greatest of all time, that's very singular, yet we throw it around and have all several goats. Yeah. Yes. Like a herd really, of goats. Really can't stand it. Um <laughs> so I mentioned in the all-time topics that would drive me mad, the off-field concerns thing. Um, yeah. Well, it's back, kind of. Like, it actually popped into my head because this came back when Tavondre Sweat uh, got the DWI yesterday. And, you know, he is – the Bengals have had these defensive tackles in. They clearly – one of these – Big sons of guns that play in the middle are going to be on this team. You know, they've brought them in. Sweat, Justin Rogers, Mason Smith. We've seen four. I think there's four of them that have come in now. The uh, McKinley Jackson. You've seen all of these guys because they, they're trying to get a handle on that. These are all guys projected second round, third round, fourth round, somewhere in there. Um, top of that group. And him being at the top, and he's been one of the most discussed. So it's brought back. Well, the Bengals clearly would take on somebody who's got all. They don't care, right? They don't. Now, I do think a portion of that still exists. I don't think they're going to necessarily be scared off by this. I also don't think he necessarily moves a ton on their board. You already knew you were getting this. Yeah. Like, he didn't have to go get. I mean, this is an all time stupid. I mean, the draft is like two weeks away, bro. It all you gotta do is just hold on tight, get the Uber, you know, whatever you gotta do for the next couple of weeks. Get drafted and go DUWI yourself wherever you want to go. I guess I don't mean actually do that. I'm just saying, like, right, you know, this you've this isn't about the crime. This is about decision making as a human being, is yeah. what it's about. And so, but I think they already knew that you worried about decision making with Sweat. He's had these weight issues. He's had these motivation issues. They've people have talked about off the field stuff because when he when he's doing it and going for it on the field, he's a first round talent, man. Like he's a dude. But all the other stuff has been why he's talked about in round two. So I don't necessarily think it changes it. He's still tantalizing as a – he's just a boom bust, and you know you're getting something that could bust because yeah. uh, you worry about some of the the motivational and decision-making stuff like this. But I don't know that it moves it that far. They're willing to take it on, but they, they're far less tolerant of stupid decision-making with people than they used to be. I think yeah. there was a thought in the past they could coach that out of them, right? I don't think this particular regime views it that way. I think they have the, in my opinion, the proper view that in some respects you are who you are and you get what you get. If you try to use that as your advantage to get value on a guy. Yeah. Well, a couple things. One, it's funny that back at Super Bowl, we'd say, we said somebody will screw up and do something stupid and get arrested at the Super Bowl. You can almost count on that every year with the draft. There's always a dude that does, this sort of stupid thing. It was Jalen Carter 
it was Laramie Tunsil way back in the day. It was Warren Sapp. There's always some knucklehead that just can't behave leading up to the draft. And it is a sign of they maybe can't behave in life in general. But here's the thing. And I think it does kind of go back to that stigma the Bengals had for so long about being the team of recluses and non-law abiding citizens. Every team out there will still take a guy if he's talented. There's not a team out there that's so high and mighty that they're just not going to take a guy. And if if teams feel like they can get extra value on this guy because he drops a little bit, then they're definitely going to take him. And I think Jalen Carter is a great example was, you know, a guy people died from his car racing incident. Yeah. And yet there the Eagles took him. And by like week three, everyone's like, oh, everybody was stupid for passing on Jalen Carter. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but to say that any team out there is not going to take a guy if they see max value is crazy. They're all going to do it. So I, I think you're probably right. The Bengals probably see the value in him, just like a lot of other teams do. And he probably kind of sticks in that spot for better or worse. But, you know, you you can be asking for trouble down the road. It's that's the, just the business of it, in my opinion. And yeah, I don't I don't know that it changes much, but other teams will pounce on him if they don't. It's not like he's just going to drop out of the draft because he did a very stupid thing. No, uh, Rasheed Rice is a good example. I mean, there was notable concerns about who he was off the field uh, last year, and you know, Kansas City said we're willing to do it. Well, you, you and they reaped the benefits, and now they're feeling the other side of it because eventually mm-hmm. you do worry that guys are who they are in in many yeah. respects, and that only gets amplified more. Once they've gotten, you can almost always get one good year, right? They show up. It's a new place. My first job. I want to make, I want to be the man. You're going to get the best version of that guy for a year, typically. Then they're the man. They've got money. They've got fame. And you're only going to then lean more into your core. Now, you can always mature. You can always turn the corner. But I think that's when you start to worry about those risks is in year two and three, specifically, because they're still young, they're still all the kind of who they were, and now it's only been amplified by fame and money and notoriety and all that stuff. And and some of that change, you get a better view of that now because the NIL, like these guys, get money earlier. You see how they handle some of that stuff and the fame yeah. earlier a little bit more. But you're still you still know what that can become when they're just hey, they've got lots of free time and ability to make decisions on their hands and. If they're typically the type of person you worry about the decisions that they make, well, you got to deal with that. Yeah. Those, I mean, those guys become really the biggest risk reward guys in the draft. And if it was a one off thing and they're not a knucklehead, you know, good for you. And really, <laughs> I hate to throw Joe Mixon's name out there because things got kind of weird over the past year, year and a half. But for how long was he a model citizen after his incident? And I'm, again, I'm certainly not condoning anything involved with that but you can come out the other side with something that's that works out pretty well but again then you had weird stuff come up with joe mixon years later so i don't know maybe it's always there maybe there is growing up but you never know it's just the chance there's just going to be a risk assessment every team's going to do on Tavondre sweat and somebody's still going to probably take him i would bet in that same range that he was projected you are in the game of predicting human behavior yeah. Good luck. A lot of people have been trying to do that for centuries. Okay. Yeah. Millennia. All right. You're just not like you just, there's just no way. And that takes me back, you know, to kind of wrap up this whole conversation to the Duke Tobin point of view. And one that I think most really talented GMs get, if you get too full of yourself, thinking I can draft better than everyone else and I know better, that's when you lose from consistency over the years. More swings. You just need more picks <laughs> because the more yeah. swings you get, the better chance you have of getting hits because you're not going to hit at a higher rate for the most part. I mean, that's just the bottom line of it. It's There's just not a lot that would ever suggest of what has happened in this draft that you show up and I see it better than everybody else does. Too many people, there's too much information. People know too much. There's there to think that you've got all kinds of angles that absolutely nobody else does. You can maybe be a little bit better. You can have a decent hit rate. You can be good at certain things. But 
for the most part, getting yourself the most swings is going to be the way for every team to get the most hits, not – you know, saying that I, I picked the best player because I know how to pick the best players. That's not necessarily how it works. But that's that's my final final thought on that as we uh as we wrap it up. Uh Jay, do you got any uh any Arby's or Jay? See, I was gonna talk about Arby's and I instantly thought of Jay, Dave. I'm ready to do the Arby's. <laughs> and my first thought was Jay loves fries, curly fries, yeah. beef and cheddars. No, he doesn't like the cheddar. We know that. He actually likes just the roast beef so much, but do you have anything, any good, any good stories? I got nothing. I got WrestleMania talk. Yeah. WrestleMania happened this weekend. And we were kind of yeah. talking for a show about how, you know, I don't really watch wrestling much anymore, but back in the day, really the best part of wrestling was always like when the, was, was the, the intro was when the music yeah. went off. Right. And everyone's like, ah, oh, and this happened, I guess this weekend, Undertaker showed back up out of nowhere. One of the all time great, entrance is just a dong and the place goes dark. like that is <laughs> epic i think the nfl should lean into this i think teams should lean into this like i love the idea of you have a your third down running back is just a beast right like let's say like, <laughs> ajay spears or let's just say chase brown comes in in a reverse Anytime he comes onto the field, like, boom, like that's oh God, that's Chase Brown's music. Right? <laughs> I want to have that in between. Like anytime somebody that only plays and plays a game when he comes in, it's like the the sixth offensive lineman with Jackson Carmen would come in to be like <laughs> the out the, the the big tight end blocking offensive lineman. That should have some kind of music associated with it. Oh my yeah. god, that's Jackson Carmen's music. They've gone jumbo. <laughs> you know, it I reminds think, me I think of we need to get a full lean. Applying it to other sports, the best you've probably seen it is with closers coming in in baseball. Yeah. And like, you know, Mariana Rivera and, and Trevor Hoffman or Ricky Wild Thing Vaughn. Mm -hmm. Uh the the only thing I've seen that where it's kind of that way in football is when there's a, a punt returner that everybody fears, whether it's Devin Hester, it's Reggie Bush, Deshaun Jackson, that when they came in, the place would just ramp up because of that. And it, yeah. that would be perfect for some some entrance music for a, a stud punt returner. You know who had this? And this connects both of us. Russell mm -hmm. Wilson. He had when uh -huh. he would come in for Seattle, they That's would right. play Fishes. Wilson, mm -hmm. the whole crowd would chant. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that was kind of a version of it. Look, connects your Seahawks. My fish, fished them, you know? One of the few <laughs> things that connects us, Dave. Well, and we had it. But I, I think that's it. I think the punters, should punters have music? I don't see Brad, why not. Brad Robbins' music is just like... <laughs> 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 hopefully Brad kicks better. Hopefully hopefully it turns better. If you got, like a, you got a punter that fans are just not feeling, right? I But I think we need yeah. more. I think we need more of this individual player theme music for when they come in your role players let's play them up the the music drop in is pretty special but mm -hmm. i don't know Love you it. just got guys coming in and out on packages i don't know how that works <laughs> is that no, the, uh, the, the third down linebackers music just dropped uh, i don't know i don't know how you fit it in <laughs> david skater has entered the game <laughs> love it all right uh thanks everybody for listening Jay and I will be back on Wednesday. We're going wide receivers. We're going all in on these receivers, specifically these day two guys. There's so many of them. Hayden Winks from uh, Underdog Fantasy is going to join uh, and talk a little bit about all of those guys, and we're going to kind of give you the full view of what that looks like. So looking forward to doing that with Jay on Wednesday. And, of course, Hude Light with Mario.